because at the end of the day, when you sit down with like a blank page, it's you and your instinct. And there's no rules that can tell you as much as your instinct can tell you what's right for you and how it's right for your story. And I hope that you, uh, that you follow that. First off, John, thank you so much for doing this. I'm really excited to chat with you. I looked at your IMDb Pro. I'm so impressed. Can't wait to talk about some of these things. You're a writer, director. You've been working in this industry for 10 years. Your first job was Mad Men, which is one of my favorite shows. So I can't wait to hear about that. And then um, you worked again with Matt Wiener on The Romanoffs. You started on Willow as a script coordinator and was promoted to staff writer, which is amazing. And then you've been working independently, directing and writing most recently with your series Grounded for Out TV. And then with ScreenCraft 2019, you won the short screenplay competition with Dunked and you are finalist in the fellowship. And it looks like you got your first manager through ScreenCraft. So to start, you know, there's so many kind of places to start, but I would love to just start with Mad Men. Like, tell me a little bit about working on Mad Men. How did you kind of get into that position? Like whatever you can go into, would love to hear about that. Yeah, I mean, it was, and, and I'll say first, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk with you, you know, as well. And ScreenCraft has been uh, a great ally over the last few years of my career. Love to hear that. Um, Mad Men, you know, I went to, I ended up on Mad Men because of a snowstorm in Montana in February of 2014. Um, and it sounds kind of convoluted, but follow along and we'll get there. Uh, I went to Emerson College in Boston and there's a whole story that leads up to that, um, but they have an LA program out here, which I which I moved out here uh, January 2014 to do. And you, know, you have an internship and you start making your way in the industry. My directing professor there was doing uh, a short film, a big budget short film, a Western, um, and so he took a week off of class uh, to film in Montana. And when he came back, he told us all about the shoot. And it turned out that they had been hit by the largest snowstorm in the recorded history of the town that they were filming. Wow. Uh, wow. So the ending looked great, but they lost a day and they had to do pickups back here in Los Angeles. And so I said, you know, can I come to set? I'll PA, I'll be your assistant, I'll get coffee. I ended up being an extra in the movie because I was the only college student that could pass for an English professor from Montana. So I threw on a jacket and like sat next to the lead. Uh, and I, you know, the next day I emailed the producers who I had met, you know, briefly and said, you know, thank you for letting me work for free. I had done a few of those at that point. And one of them emailed back and said, well, I'm the production coordinator on, on Mad Men and we're getting started on the final season. Like, would you like to come work on Mad Men? Um, so I didn't have to think about that for too long. Uh, and I was lucky that it worked out that I did some, that I was able to transfer my internship there for a bit. And then I was hired on as a PA and I worked in various departments in, in production, um, in props, in art across the final season. And as a first job, you know, it's wild to get <laughs> hired onto what was probably one of the biggest shows in the world at the time, Breaking Bad was, was done. Um, but, uh, you know, Aside from a, a lot of shows are the same, no matter how successful or not they are. But, it, but this was a great opportunity because everyone welcomed me and I got to move across these various departments and see how like production at that huge scale worked. Gotcha. That's and that's so sort of the, you know, TV, TV has been booming since I came out here. And that was sort of the, uh, the start down a path. Gotcha. That's, that's awesome. I mean, even just like, the the intuition that you had emailing those producers you worked with like that is some that's one of those things like which i would love to hear your thoughts on a little bit is like when you're working on these sets are you kind of thinking about networking or building relationships or are you kind of in that place of like okay these are people that i'm i need to show them like i'm a good worker like what like how did you kind of like you must have been very you met, you must have made a really good first impression for that producer to say hey we're, we're come work on Mad Men so like do you have any tips I mean, with I, to me it feels and... natural you know to send that email it's just sort of it's just the 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 skills I picked up the way I was raised I don't really think about it as networking necessarily um, and it is about building relationships you know when you're working um, sixty hours a week or more on something like you will be if you're successful in what doing this when you're hiring, when, when it comes down to hiring people, you're thinking about their talent. Sure. But you're also thinking about like, who do I want to spend more than 50% of my waking hours with? Yep. That's you know, it. I was very lucky that I, you know, I got along with this 
person who's a production coordinator at Mad Men. I've worked for him for many years um, since. He taught me everything I know. I call him my business dad. Uh, and I tell the story about the snowstorm in Montana just because of like the causality and 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 the cause and effect of all of this where, you know, I was doing an internship at Jeremy Renner's company at the time and like nothing was going to come out of that. But then I do this thing that I didn't, that if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have been there. And it leads to the start of, you know, start of sort of getting a foothold in, in the town. Yeah. And, um, you know, I got very lucky. It was a, it was a unique opportunity. When, but I, what I tell people is that like, if you are, if, if, if you're a good worker and you're proactive and you, and you, keep an eye out for these things and take the steps for these things, you'll have the same, everyone can have the same unique opportunity. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like what you, you, you just really took advantage of. And not, and I mean that in a good way, like you, you really seize that opportunity, you know, and it's so, is so strange, like how that led to working on Mad Men, a snowstorm, like you'd never think that, but it's like that kind of stuff right. happens, you know, it's like, but it also, it makes me think like, you, you must have, you must, you have to keep your eyes open because you never know what kind of thing might happen. And you kind of have to really be looking and making sure you're seeing all the angles to how something could go down. And it looks yeah. like, really, you know, and that's super- like, you know, when I've been, I've started to be asked to do things like this and to talk to college kids. And, and, you know, when I was in college, I remember being frustrated with these people come in who have had 20 or 40 year careers. And they say, then you ask, how do I get started? And they say, well, there's no clear path, you know? And, and I feel like I go into that story because that is, that is the answer. That is that there's no clear path is that it's going to be something you don't expect that is just a combination of factors. And um, only a few people are, are going to have that of your peers are going to have that quick and undeniable success that we all envision. And for the rest of us, for the majority of us, it's a buildup of uh, experiences projects learning that eventually tips the scales into you know what we call professional yeah and i love that i mean it, it's really good advice you know like you you just said it like tiny percent of 0.01 percent is gonna all the stars are gonna perfectly align so whatever if that happens to you great but let's focus on like what we can really do which that leads me to ask you what what is like for someone who really is just getting started, they're just starting to get into screenwriting. They're just kind of starting to work their way through. What do you think is like one tip that that person should be working on the most for themselves to really set themselves up in the best way possible to find these opportunities? Yeah. I mean, that's a, there's so many answers to that question. I think the one answer that applies to everyone is to do the writing. Um, there are a lot of people who I, I've encountered a lot of folks who say they want to be screenwriters among people outside the industry, among my peers, among whatever. And, uh, and then as you get into it, you find that they haven't actually written a much or in some cases, some rare cases, they haven't written anything, which is always amusing. Um, but just doing it, and this doesn't mean you have to have a huge script library either, but doing it, uh, getting your script out there, submitting to contests and fellowships if you're if you're able to do that you know it's it's the biggest broadest thing that you can do that everyone needs to do beyond that you know i got really lucky in my my experiences and my advice all comes from that you know film school college work your way up the ladder perspective um i don't know exactly what i would advise for someone who's outside the industry right now or who is who is an older screenwriter or you know and is trying to break in but uh, I think the thing to say about that is that um, there are not necessarily more doors than ever, I think, but it's it's less necessary than ever to have that uh, support staff pedigree that I had, you know, and that certainly helped me. But in terms of breaking in, um, I think that the with the streaming market and the way things have shifted, there is an equal hunger and and a good amount of attention for people who come from um, other backgrounds, other creative backgrounds, or uh, other life experiences, if you can, can find a way to make your connections. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Which later, I would love to kind of talk, get your thoughts on like the state of cinema and the industry. I love talking about that stuff. But um, one question is, um, and I know, again, this is one of these things, there's so many different answers or ways you could go into it. But 
what tips do you have for people who like, how do you, how did you learn screenwriting? How did you really start to learn the craft? Do you have any books you recommend? Do you have any kind of tips that you could give someone who's kind of really just getting started? Like, what would you advise them to do to really start to hone in on, on their voice, on like their craft, like any tips? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, there, there, there are multiple steps. I personally, I've, I've been, I've been writing since I was a kid, you know, multiple different things. I thought about uh, maybe I'd write novels at one point. Uh, so that was something that I just had been fooling around with for a long time. I dialed it on screenwriting, you know, in my teens. And when I went to film school, you know, I was sort of looking at doing the indie director, feature director, writer sort of thing, the Sundance sort of thing. Um, and the shift to TV was just, well, I can talk about that later. Um, you know, so I took screenwriting courses there. There are plenty of good books out there, but it's like, you know, if you can read, if, if you can read a screenplay, you and and you and you have a story to tell, like it's not that hard to figure out. Um, Don't mind me if you see me taking yeah. notes. I'm just gonna get not very but I say that, you know, I, I like to bake and I like to cook, right? And I, and to me, that and writing are very similar. You can mm, that's follow a, that's a recipe. A but then you're going to know when you taste it, you're going to know when you're looking at it. And, and if you have that instinct and it's like, um, the, 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 there's, there, there are a few books that I've liked over the years, but there's nothing that's going to unlock that. It's about finding the process that works for you and the process that gets you writing is the process that is correct. Um, you know, follow, Follow outline sheets if you find that that helps you. Read scripts if you find that it helps you. I think one specific thing that I'll say is like, try to read scripts that are not like the Academy scripts. Read stuff that didn't get produced or that, you know, is a, like a B-list movie. Try to read, uh, you know, production drafts over those, you know, polished booklet things that they put out. Because, yeah. you know, you can read the social network and, and, and say like, I'm going to mimic Aaron Sorkin. Well, it, not only is that Aaron Sorkin who's been doing this for 30 years, it's like that script has gone through development, production, awards season. Like they reconcile the script with the movie that's been released. Yeah, you that's know? Very so, so in terms of self-education, this is a, a, a tip that I would give is like, try to find the stuff that try to find the actual stuff because you're not writing for, and I say this to emerging writers too, is that <clears throat> you've got to remember and take sort of the pragmatic context in, into it that like you're not going to be writing for something that gets made most of the time. You know, I'm not, the stuff I'm writing right now, I'm not writing it to get made. I'm writing it to uh, use as a sample. I'm, I, I would love for it to get made, but it's going to be a sample. It's going to help my career for it. Um, unless you're like Shonda Rhimes, rarely are you writing for something that's gonna go directly to the screen. Uh, you know, and, that, and at that level, you're writing to place in a contest. You're writing for, you're writing to get representation. And then if you succeed in those things, you're writing for um, general meetings, development, pitching. Uh, and the qualities of those scripts that people are looking for those scripts are different every step. So one thing that I like to say is like, write the thing that opens the next door. Gotcha. I like that. I, and you said one thing that I kind of want to harp on for one second, because th it's really interesting. Th and this is perfect if you're down, if you're cool with talking a little bit about kind of the uh, motivation, kind of writer's block aspect There's something I always like to get people's opinions on. You said the process that gets you writing is the process to focus on, which is a really cool way to think about it. What do you mean by that exactly? Like the process it, to me, I kind of think like that's a, cause it's like, it takes a lot of, you gotta, you gotta be, be disciplined and have inspiration or passion, whatever you want to call it to really sit down at the computer. So what, what do you mean by that exactly? I mean, you know, I don't buy into like the set of rules any of the rules that people throw out there, like you got to get up at five in the morning, you got to write 20,000 words a day, you got to do all, you got to do this thing. Um, I'm a very inconsistent, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and for a while I felt guilty about that because I wasn't sitting down and, 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 you know, writing every day, but when I, you know, for me, it's a, it's a process of, of 
not waiting for inspiration, but of letting these ideas, you know, kind of simmer, simmer and come together. And then I write in these big spurts. Um, and that's what I found works for me. If the 5 a.m. thing works for you, by all means, go do it. Uh, and there's a quote that, that, that haunts me because I can't remember who it's attributed to. But I, but I remember seeing it once and it said, like, make space for, to be creative each day. Uh, like as if you have a guest who's coming over for tea, right? Yeah. Sometimes it won't come, but you still set aside the time and the preparation for the opportunity for it to come. Yeah, I really love that. Make space oh. to be creative. That's such a, a it's. It, That's I, how I started approaching it in the last few years, and that really shifted things for me. So make yeah. space, whatever that means to you, um, and don't worry about all that sort of cult of productivity yeah and what and what do you what are your thoughts like your what is your what is your sound bite with writer's block like what is your thoughts on writer's block i get i get people saying doesn't exist and i get other people saying it does like what are your what's your quick take i think you know it, it exists in as much as there are times where you don't know what to write um there are times where i've said you know i feel that i feel like i've lost my creative voice uh like if i was singing i just can't sing right no. Um, for me, the usually the source of the writer's block is 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 one or one or two things. The main one is that I'm I'm I, I'm not writing or I'm blocked with writing because I'm not excited about what I'm writing. Well, for uh, sure, yeah, we, I feel you there definitely. It's that I feel like I should write. That it's just I sit down at the computer every day and it's like pulling teeth and. and you know, I, I, re I realized after all, like, oh, yeah, this is supposed to be fun, you know, and even down to individual scenes. It's like I realized if a scene isn't working or I don't want to write a scene, it's because it's the wrong scene, you know, yeah. and I start thinking about like, OK, what do I where does my instinct go? What do I want to see next? What do I desire to see? And the and there are different techniques you can use to answer those questions. But like, that's usually where the answer lies. And then in terms of like a, an, an actionable tip to get through writer's block is that is where I fall back on um, um, like structure sheets and diagrams and lists of questions and whatever. And like, even if you are the kind of writer that, you know, gets your back up at that, at that outlining kind of process, I find that it's worthwhile to just be able to point at this thing and say like, okay, at this point in the script, I need the character to learn something that will help them take better actions after. And even yeah. if you plug something into that, it gets you over that little hump. You can, yeah, change, for sure. you can change it back later. Yeah. But just like, uh, sitting down, creating that space, changing one thing, you know, hopefully that will, what's the metaphor of like, the rocks fall out of the stream and then, the water comes through. I'm not, I think I, I know what you're saying. I don't know the metaphor, but I know what you're saying. But I love I love that this, this like falling back on outline. So so just from listening to you for a minute. So you do you outline with the, all your projects, or is it kind of like just depending on the project? Like in any <laughs> tips that you have on outlining too. That's one of those topics that we yeah. get all the time. Like how do you even outline something? So would love to get any tips you have on outlining. Yeah, I mean it depends on the project, and it's, when I'm when I'm working alone. Um, I do outline less the, and, and when you, when you're professional, the, the, this is one thing I think it's misunderstood. And I think there, there are a lot of people out there who are very anti outline. And I feel like I know. they yeah. are misstepping a little bit just by having that attitude. I think all of these things can be useful to you. Yeah. Um, professionally, you need to learn the skill of outlining. It's separate from outlining on your own work. You're writing like two different documents, not writing on your own work. You know, you outline so that you have a plan and a map. You know, you don't start out on a cross-country road trip and, yeah. and not know what city you're driving to, right? Um, and that's like sort of how the outline works when I'm creating something on my own. Usually that's a pilot or, or a feature where you're, you're building this whole world. My prep process, you know, that leads to an outline is like exploring all the, the iterations and possibilities of, of, of who these people are, what could be happening in the story. Sometimes that leads to, more, to a more developed outline, sometimes it doesn't. On the professional scale, uh, especially in TV, you have to be able to outline 
And those outlines are very different from the, the personal outlines because it's a sales document. Your outline is not, you're not telling them every little thing that happens in the movie and, and you're not locking yourself into that. You are selling them on what the movie will be for the show, uh, what they will feel in these scenes or moments or plot or arcs. Um, and, and you have to be able to do that because these are the people who are, who are green lighting you. Sometimes they're putting up the money. Sometimes they're going and asking for the money, but you have to develop these ideas and you have to get that buy-in. Um, and so it's really more of an outline at the studio level is more of a, a, a presentation than it is, you know, a, a, a writing roadmap. Yeah. That's such a, it's so interesting. Or it's just so, that's such a, good tip to like hear that that difference it makes a huge difference to think about like outlining as this is my blueprint versus this is the thing that's going to get someone invested in this story because those are very different things um and i would love i know we're getting into process stuff more than i thought but this is amazing like i, lo I love going into that's this cool. i love talking yeah I love talking. um but like with outlining you know, pitching, cause it kind of, kind of goes into pitching. It kind of, it kind of goes into the same thing. Um, pitching is one of these things that in our community and screencraft, it is one of the most feared things that writers have. It's scary. Wh what is pitching? Where do you even start? What do you focus on? So again, I know it's kind of a broad question, but would love if you just give your thoughts or any tips on even just like where I should start if I need to start really learning to pitch my story, you know, what is kind of the best approach to get started with it? I mean, I, the, the short answer is, is that I have never been in a position to pitch a project mm -hmm. um, in the way that you're thinking, you know, that like I, in a, in I the have a professional, uh, you know, success or doors opened or whatever, where I'm walking into the room and saying, this is my show. This is what it's going to be. Um, but I do, I try to think of it. I have written pitches or I've written a lot for like that. Th this is where the fellowship applications can, can come in uh, as a, as an educational tool too. Yeah. like fellowships, you know, people complain about the fellowships. They ask for a lot of documentation. There's a low chance of getting them, but um, there's a purpose behind what the fellowship applications are asking for, because you're going, if you're developing something, you're going to need to step out those episodes and season arts, those creative, intention statements, right? That's what a pitch is. Um, and in a way you're pitching yourself all the time. You're pitching yourself for your projects every day. Every time I, you know, um, the tone of our conversation here is a lot of, I say a lot of the same stuff in a general meeting. Um, I say a lot of the same stuff, you know, if I'm asked to, you haven't asked me about any of my projects, but I've got these sound bites, you know, like, uh, and I guess it's just about, you know, I feel like I don't have a good answer, but it's about presenting. Um, if someone asks you, like, pitch your project or give me your log line, it's about presenting, like, the most engaging, most exciting version of that project. Yeah. It's yeah. You don't need to give them everything. You don't need to tell them exactly what it is. It's a it's a question and you need to get them engaged. And that's yeah. what so that's good. Talking. I mean, it's really good to hear that. And also, like, like a. You, you briefly mentioned like pitching yourself, you know, I feel like it's definitely one of those things that a lot of us, a lot of introverted writers, it's like a, one of those things that's like, oh man, I don't even know where to start, but it's like, it's business, right? It is part of the business and you have to start learning these things. So, um, so, okay. I do want to start to get into, we've, we've, I, I mean, we could talk forever at, at this point, like it's already two, but um, so, so Mad Men, right? How did you get, what was like the next kind of big thing that came after Mad Men? Like, what was that next project? And how, how did the dots connect to go from yeah, I mean, to the next project? Just to, be, just to give the overview, like Matt, that, those Mad Men connections, you know, have been the source of most of my career. Mm -hmm. uh, that same person who hired me onto Mad Men is now a VP at Lucasfilm. And a few years ago said to me, we're starting up this series. I'll introduce you to the showrunner. And we'll see where it goes. And, and awesome. um, that person has been, you know, I got lucky to have that sort of mentor and champion. Um, uh, you know, and, and so I worked with him following Mad Men. I worked with him on, on several jobs across uh, various shows. I did a stint in like the studio side um, just to, because it was reliable. I needed a break from production. It just, it just burns you out. And that, and this, and I, and, and this period of my life, you know, 
I learned something from that period that's relevant to our to everything we've been talking about, which is that like I was working these 60, 80 hour weeks on a show as a sort of as a PA, but taking on more and more. I was production secretary, I was clearance coordinator, I was doing all of these things. And I realized like, holy shit, I haven't written anything for six months because I've been working this much and I am I, and I've been working for like minimum wage basically, and I'm brain dead, you know. And those shows, there were good people on them. There were there were good learning, good learning, and good opportunities on them. But they those weren't the shows that were going to like promote me. They don't look at you in that way all the time. Yeah, uh, gotcha. And so one thing I tell people as I'm, you know, that I come to tell people as I offer what I've learned from all of this. I, I like to say I don't really have any advice. Um, I'm I'm still learning things too, but I can tell you what happened to me. Uh, <clears throat> was like picking the job that allows you to write is really important versus that, balancing that with climbing the ladder. Um, really good tip right there. So, you know, after a few of those, I did, I did the studio side stint, um, which was, which was nice. It was boring to me. I don't, it's too slow. I like production because like, and it's go, 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 go. Um, and that's when the Romanoffs came up. And someone else from uh, another young person I worked with on Mad Men emailed me and said, you know, I just had, I had to turn down this uh, job on the Romanoffs because I'm on something else. Would you like me to send your resume over? And I said, yes, of course. And then, you know, um, people from Mad Men were coming over the Romanoffs. So I had, a, you know, I went in with connections um, and I ended up being on there as a, as assistant to one of the co-EPs. Um, who was not a writer, but was sort of the number two to Matt on everything on the production side. It was before uh, eight seven one had unionized, or the or the, it was before script coordinators had joined eight seven one. So I took on like script coordinator duties as an EP assistant. Um, I was helping with like uh, translating the non English dialogue, and you know going back and forth with Matt on that. I was doing clearances. Uh, I helped with locations. I helped with like training the local staff. When you reach that after this was like four years into my career, I think, and I had done all the PA and I had reached that point of like the apex of of assistant, like the super assistant, the person yeah. who gets to do everything else. Um, and so that and then I ended up going on. I was on for the writing period and I ended up going into the production period with them. And we went to 10 cities on seven continents over the course of a year. Uh, I was there on set every day. And that was just like I call that like TV grad school, you know. That's awesome. And so that was like the, when this, you know, that is sort of the answer to like, you're like, what was the next connect the dots? The next big thing. It was that. So when, so like, this is one of these things where it's very unique to you because everyone I interview, there's always, it's, it's always different. Some people never worked in a writer's room. Some people have like, but, but it, I, I want to ask you this question, which you can take it wherever you want, but in the current state right now of cinema, of streaming, Netflix, like, do you think, do you think it should be a goal? Do you think if there's a writer that wants to write in a room, what do you think is kind of the best approach that they should try to take? Do you think being an assistant, do you think kind of that is the way to do it? It sounds like there, you learned so much working the, I mean, it's in what everything you just said, it's like, man, the yeah. amount of responsibilities that you had doing that like you must have learned so much but what do you kind of what what are kind of your thoughts on like right now the state of the industry and what is what are some of the routes that we can take to try to get in you know i mean i i'm it's one of those times where i'm i am personally also sort of out of ideas on how to how to get in how to get jobs such an interesting time right now yeah things have changed massively and they're continuing to change i think there is a lot of value in that assistant track i also think that because it's the one that i was on um, I don't know the experience of, of, of breaking into the room from outside of the system. Uh, I know that people have done it from writing, you know, plays, comic books, um, indie film, or from having uh, people, people with life experience, you know, medical, yeah. law, army. I've heard of people breaking in through just having this really interesting, having a good script, of course, and then having this really interesting life experience and personality back that up. So it certainly can be done. Um, I think the state of the industry is like, I would I, I would have had a different answer for you last week, and I'll have a different answer next week. Um, yeah. We're at the convergence of a lot of things, and I don't want to sound too fatalist, but like um, you know, we're coming, we're still coming off of COVID. Uh, that changed everything. Um, the streaming, there's a lot of uh, uh, turmoil, flux, whatever you want to call it, in streaming. 
you know, yeah. it's, not, it's not the boom that it was five or six years ago. Um, and uh, the, the, the economy of the country at large is, is very uncertain. And um, we're coming up on the guilds are all renegotiating our contracts next year. Um, and I don't want to prognosticate about that necessarily. But all of these things, I think, are creating um, an environment that is going to be very uncertain for about a year. So yeah. like, the answer at the moment, if you are, for people who are like actively trying to make these decisions now, I think my answer would be like, if you're in, stay in, uh, or whatever, or I, let me rephrase that. Stay in whatever position of stability you can, whether that whether you're working in the industry right now, if you can keep that, keep it. If you're outside, um, I don't want to dissuade anyone, but maybe 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 uh, hold off on a big leap for a minute. You know, don't make a big leap right now. I think because one thing I tell uh, one thing I've come I found myself telling like college students and high school students who are trying to break in, um, which applies to everyone trying to break in, is that like. Um, there's no there's no harm in staying small for a bit and building um, building that foundation or support structure of your writing, your connections, or all of that. You don't need to. I was in college during the um, during like the the uh, the social media content streaming boom. Everybody was doing a YouTube series. Everybody was doing Vimeo, and uh, part of it was my college culture. Part of it was the culture at large. People were getting focused on. Um, like doing a big swing. I'm gonna make this one project that's gonna blow up and go viral and um, they'll get me meetings, it'll get me whatever. Uh, not only is that unlikely, it's, it's, it's real unlikely now. So like, I think now is a time of caution. Like keep advancing yourself, certainly. Don't take huge risks. Don't worry about rushing things. Um, as long as you're writing and you're doing what you can to like move the ball down the field each day, uh, you're doing fine. Yeah. And do you think, what do you, what do you think? Isn't there a rider strike in talks happening in 2023 or is that rumor? Uh, I heard someone talking I mean, about there is, it. There is not a strike. We have not, you know, begun contract negotiations and we have not, you know, the strike authorization vote, vote won't come until the spring. Gotcha. Um, you know, certainly no one wants to strike. Uh, I and many other writers of my generation, uh, many, many of my peers, you know, we do see, the you know the potential need for a strike we, we support yeah. the idea of a strike the strike authorization vote will be taken if it comes to that after negotiations has progressed and so like who knows where it'll be by then yeah. uh, i think that this this ties back to the original question about those pathways because one of the issues we're dealing with is that um rooms have got smaller there are many more projects that have like just one writer. There are, there are uh, episode orders are shorter, you know, like there's a big difference to the economy when you have something on, on, like, on, you know, like the good doctor on ABC that has like 20 something episodes a season. And yeah. you have, um, you know, Willow has eight other shows now have six. Which is, is, and then you have, you know, six or eight writers and it's like, okay, well, we're just, we're, we don't have any more writing to do. Yeah. You know? And so like, some of that can be rectified through the contract. Some of it is just a cultural thing. And like, um, you know, that's why I say, I think everything is going to be uncertain for the next, for the next year or so. Cause like, we're trying to, everyone wants to keep the industry and our art alive. We yeah. all agree on that. Um, but we need to do something to, revitalize it at the moment i think yeah i mean i i wasn't we i wasn't really planning on asking you about this stuff but it is interesting because like from me listening to content and interviews and stuff like that yeah it seems like there definitely is some type of like disconnect right now with streaming and even like royalties how does that work with some streaming platforms and stuff and so i love that advice like some people are too like i love the advice it almost sounds like you're you're what you're what i'm getting from it is focus on your craft, focus on becoming a good writer, focus on your process and be patient, which is like really good advice right now. You know, I think that's a really good way to think about it. So I appreciate that. I mean, that's all you have at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned Willow. So already, I can't even believe it's already two freaking 15. I know. I know. Can you tell me about like what, like, I would just love to hear about your experience on Willow being in the writer's room 
is so, to me, it seems like such an amazing thing. Like this, these people you come to see every day, it's like a family, the collaboration aspect of it. It just seems like it's so amazing. So I'd love to hear your experience on Willow and just the things you went through writing with people, the collaboration process, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's still hard for me to even, even summarize because I feel like I'm still learning from it in a lot of ways. Uh, I had been involved in writers' rooms before, so some of what I say might like be an amalgamation. I hadn't been in the writers' room, but like an amalgamation of like working closely with Matt and you know on the other shows that I was writers' PA on at times. Um, I came into Willow, you know, as a script coordinator and an assistant because of that connection that said, you know, um, who was able to introduce me to John Casson, and uh, he and I just connected on an interpersonal level really quickly. We had um, a lot of the same tastes in in movies and tv and and just interests in like what we aspire to uh, create um and so i was very lucky that from you know i was his assistant through the lead up to the room the end of development lead up to the room and then i was very lucky that when we started the room he welcomed me into it uh you know to even in that support staff role to hear everything that was going on and, and the process there um, without going too much into it, was like, that was his outlook for everybody, that everyone can contribute something. We're all creative, you know, uh, no matter what your role on the show is. Um, That's and awesome. then, you know, it was, it was, a, it was, we got hit, we got in a few weeks of the room before the COVID shutdown, right? Oh, so no. <sighs> my experiences, you know, are different from any other room too. We went to Zoom uh, and we did, I think, it, you know, it, it really, the job kept me sane because mm. we were, you know, uh, six or eight people, you know, that I, could, that I was talking to every day that really um, helped get through that time and being creative together. You know, I hear stories of, uh, you know, competitive rooms or, or rooms where, you know, that are, you know, whatever. Um, everyone on Willow was embodied that same energy that John brought of like, we're all creative. We all have things to contribute. Um, everything, when you're in a room on any show, you know, you sort of have, particularly on a season one show, you're sort of looking at like doing, you know, establishing a lot of these things for the first time. So what are all the possibilities that it could be? Um, yeah. And one of the things uh, Bob Dolman, who wrote the film said early on is that like, was about being vulnerable in the room and you have to be able to bring like, don't be afraid to bring out what you think might be the bad idea, because oftentimes the right idea is hidden in, in the bad idea. Or I've found it's often hidden in like the funny idea. You know, I'm not a comedy writer, but I do look for the humor because like if you go from if you look at like this is the serious melodrama version, this is the satirical version, you're going to be able to triangulate between those, you know, some other thing. Um you know, so the room went on through COVID and through all that first season-ness of it, of figuring it out. And like many streaming shows, we were we were writing and then filming separately in Wales uh, after the writing period, like we did on the Romanoffs where they wrote, and then we went off and filmed. Um, so there were all those things were factors. And just to, to give like the 30,000 foot view, um, you know, I was welcomed into the room. I started taking on, uh, uh, they gave me some freelance writing assignments as things went on, which were amazing. Um, I, they did end up promoting me to staff writer later on in the process. I was on the show for like more than a year. Um, That's and, awesome. You know, John and Wendy and the execs at Lucasfilm were just so welcome. And I got so lucky to have people who welcomed in a new writer in that way. And, uh, it, you know, ultimately, I'm, I'm, I co-wrote episode three, which comes out next week, uh, which is just you know, it still doesn't feel real to uh, to look at these things and, and hear actors that I've respected for decades, like say words that I wrote uh, and to see this thing that lived in our heads for so long. And then among this private group of people is now out there. Um, That's the thing that's so like yeah. amazing. Like that idea of it started in your head, it gets on a page. And then it gets seen and then it gets shown to the world and you get to see it come to life. Like that is just a most beautiful thing. And like another thing you said earlier, which is like, I love, I just like to harp on this because again, this is what like the, the fact that you're in a room where it sounds to me like they kind of became family for you, especially during the hard times of COVID, you know, it's like, 
that's like the dream for a lot of us. You know, a lot of us are a bunch of outcasts who don't have family out here in LA. And it's like, that is just, just sounds like an amazing thing. And you kind of talked about it a little bit, but like, what, what, what do you, what do you think, what did you learn? I know that's such a broad question, but because COVID is such a unique time that we're still going through, it's so interesting. Like, what do you, anything particular that you kind of got out of COVID and and being on your, in your writer's room during COVID zoom, what's the difference between zoom writing and working with people that way versus like physically sitting down, like would love to just get a little bit of your thoughts on that. I mean, oh, there's a lot to say. And there's something that we sort of blew past uh, that I wanted to make sure to circle back to. Oh, geez. Um, We'll have to do another one at some point or something. There's uh, a lot. Yeah, yeah, it was something about collaboration. Maybe it'll come back to me later. Um, The COVID of it all, I really struggled with it first um, because, well, wait, oh, wait, no, sorry. Can we just reset, do another take? Yeah. Uh, you know, you talked about the, the 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 collaboration and the family and the intensity of it all, and it really is like like I'm drawn to this 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 stuff. Um, like you said, because of being a little bit of an outcast, because of being out here on our own. When you're on a when you're on a production, when you're on a good one, it's often like summer camp or uh, or like being in 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 college. You know, where you're with this tightly knit group of people. It's sort of all you think about. Um, but then you get to go for, go from show to show and it changes um, yeah. you know, semester. Um, so it's just a wonderful thing for, if you have that type of personality, I know writers who like don't want anything to do with that and they want to have their, their nine to five and they want to have their quiet space. And I love the chaos. Um, the co- and, and, and I think that ties to the COVID of it all because uh, I felt like that was a bit, the community of it was snatched away a bit at first. And so that was really tough. I think, um, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to be in another room. Um, so this is my only point of reference, but like going from in person to zoom, uh, you know, you on a zoom, you, you, you're not, you're not all in the same space. You don't know, you, you're not sitting around a table and being able to see where people are looking or how they're reacting or, or hear, you can't hear the breathing of the other person. Um, you can't have a, a, a side conversation or a whisper or a, or a hey, look at my notebook. Um, and Zoom offers a lot of opportunity to involve writers from other places or writers who, and like any work from home situation, it should remain an option because there, you know, people with kids, uh, people in other cities, whatever. That's that's great to include them. But I do think that for the TV writing process in particular, being in a room together uh, is invaluable. And, yeah. and feeling that energy. And we did, as you, as we all, the world accommodated to it. We've all accommodated to this. Um, but I do really look forward to going back to an in-person room. Um, yeah. I'm able to. I mean, it's a huge difference. I mean, it's it's like we could go into the whole theaters versus watching something on your phone, laying in bed, like the difference there. Um, but I would like to kind of get, um, I, I guess, because we're kind of starting to get toward the end, you know, so many people in our community and the screencraft community and in these online communities are, it's really hard when you're first starting out, as I'm sure, you know, to kind of like conceptualize the reality of what your future could be with, with enough work, with enough opportunity. And so I like to ask this question because I don't hear a lot of people talk about this much, but in terms of like, in terms of like motivation or self-esteem or sanity even do you have any tips do you have any processes or any kind of things that you could share that could help us lone riders like outcasts like you said stay sane find a community like get motivation build build our confidence and self-esteem like anything that you could go into there to like just everything that you've been through um i think that's always so helpful to get some of that stuff you know find a therapist um yeah for sure. yeah, that's, the, that's the joke. That's the trope for a reason, right? Um, no, I mean, that's just so, that's such a broad, it's a great question. It's very broad. Um, and I, all of the things that I've talked about today, you know, come out of uh, being, you know, having done this for a while, having been through the art school, college thing, um, and synthesizing these, looking back at these periods of my life and saying, like, what do 
what would do I wish I had known then? So like yes. everything that I've said today is sort of related to that. You know, like find the job that allows you to write, uh, find your process. Um, definitely find, you know, in terms of staying sane, find things to do that are not writing. Uh, creative hobbies. I love to bake. Um, I, I am also a photographer. I picked up their film camera again this year for the first time in a while. I have a writer friend who, you know, is, is, is uh, plays piano and violin and does musical things. And you've got to have that because so much of what we do is outside of our control. You really need to have a creative outlet that you control. Yeah. Um, and you can decide the outcome. You know, friends and family build that strong, build that support network wherever you can find it. I think um, um, there was something else you said in there. You know, people didn't talk about mental health the way we, even the way, even now, the way we did, sorry, the other way around. People didn't talk about mental health 10 years ago when I was graduating the way we do now. You know, um, Me Too happened in 2017, 2018, and that changed, I think, a lot of the outlook, not just for uh, uh, harassment and sexual impropriety and, and, and that kind of abuse, but also for other abusive workplace practices and other, um, you know, 60 hours a week. I, I love it when I'm doing it, but it's too much, you know? And so we are, I think, as an industry, kind of looking at that stuff on the whole. But, um, you know, creating that space creating that space for you to be a person separately from the job, you know, is really important. And, uh, oh yeah, I, I remember what I like to say about this now. Uh, remember that your career is separate from your creativity, mm -hmm. you know, like climbing that support staff ladder or doing your networking or doing your contests, all of that validation is separate from, um, you know, you as a person, the artist that actually sits down to like write and create something. Mm -hmm. And it's a, and this is sort of a good thing to say in conclusion as we come to the end, you know, uh, I'm just some fucking guy, right? I, I can tell you about what's what's happened for me, what's worked for me, what hasn't worked for me. Um, but you know what's best for you, I hope, and you you do, even if you don't believe that right now. Um, you know what's best for you, and you know what's best for your writing. Um, and because at the end of the day, when you sit down with like a blank page. It's you and your instinct. And there's no rules that can tell you as much as your instinct can tell you what's right for you and how to start your story. And I hope that you, uh, that you follow that. 